it visually would be different. You're not wrong. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm Ian with full throttle battery. Full throttle <laughs> battery. You're keeping that one. Oh my goodness, we got you. Yeah, I'm not the only one that makes uh, fumbles around here. Yeah. Uh, today we're talking all about Polaris Razor Pro, not XP Pro R, the 2021 release rumors. What do you uh, What do you think going into this, Ian? Well, first and foremost, I want to point out the obvious. We are in our ninth month, and you don't have a shreddy shirt. Like, I'm wearing about my fourth or fifth, and, and uh-huh. you, don't, you don't have a shreddy shirt. You have more hats than any five people I know. You don't have a shreddy hat. So Hey, hey, we were just literally talking about this in northern Washington about how I wanted to get the black shreddy hat. Yeah. So I need to get, uh, I need you to drop the contrast when you edit color on this so it doesn't expose <laughs> how dirty my beautiful Superior Motorsports hat is. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. We'll just drop it down so it looks like a floating logo. Yeah. But uh, we're not here to talk about that. No, we're here to talk about Polaris. And I am sporting my Polaris Think Outside shirt and my Polaris hat because I am a Polaris fanboy through and through. Turn, as everybody turn calls around me. and show them your Polaris tramp stamp. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I don't want to put the camera that low. So, um, But anyways, uh, yeah. So we've put out a bunch of content recently about uh, Polaris patents, uh, Pro XP sightings, content around that. Uh, the rumor mill has been speculating for a long time about Polaris's transition to a greater than two cylinder engine and uh today we're going to talk about it did we get any flack for it <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you i've never been trolled so many times in My one day gosh. um all the haters are coming out of the woodworks we are making an impact apparently um on people's mind a share on this guys the ford chevy dodge debate is for the peasants come on <laughs> So, uh, yeah, there's definitely um, two trains of thought. There is the uh, believe it when we see it type camp, and there is the I can't wait to see it camp. And I'm definitely in the I can't wait to see it because um, I, I can honestly say that I've seen some things and uh, have full faith in uh, Polaris to put these things out. Yeah, anybody that has problems with innovation, you pick the wrong hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and the wrong brand. This yeah. is one of the most r&d centric high output 100%. brands and the market so they drive the industry yeah they Let's definitely call it what do. it is yeah they they put more more units out than any other vendor uh on the market in, in a given quarter than they do a full year you you said something to me that absolutely blew blew me away once because polaris is a massive company they massive. own they own so many different companies and they have deals for their employees they have deals where you can acquire vehicles. You can acquire vehicles at discounts. You can fly. I mean, they want people out promoting their product, sure. driving their product. They do more in that than their co- competitors do in actual sales. Sometimes yeah. in certain segments, that's exactly the case. That's cr- it's just baffling. You have to understand that Polaris is not just a UTV maker. They don't just make razors, right? Right. They own a ton of different companies, including golf cart manufacturers, uh, pontoon boat companies of some of the most premier companies in the world that build uh, luxury boats. Uh, they own, you know, PG and PG and A companies like Climb and Five Hundred Nine. Um, they own tons of brands. I and think they own Taylor Dunn. They just I, you go to their yeah. website. They have logos all over the place of yeah. all the different brands and Taylor Dunn golf carts. I think yeah. they own that. Yeah, um, and they own Gem and yeah. and a bunch of different electric. Uh, don't say Gem around me. I stay in the battery <laughs> business, so it's, I just no. A little, little salty on that one. No, it's not a salty thing. They're just so tough to apply to yeah. and work on. Like they, I've never found a charger. They. Oh man, I could take up this whole show. <laughs> all right, episode uh, twenty four. <laughs> We're here to talk all, about uh, <laughs> Polaris rumors. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm super excited because this is a vehicle that I've been speculating about for years, and people have just brushed me off. So I'm feeling a little bit of a uh, I told you so coming around. Well, I've got you know, we are talking about rumors, but they're pretty valid. We've gotten some great sources. I'm going to pull the I told you so card on a couple of things too. So yeah. get after so it. So let's get into it. Um, for the longest time, uh, there was what we call in the industry the blue tarp photos of uh, uh, the pro chassis on a trailer being covered by an t- uh, inadequate tarp showing off a lot of its features while being towed down the road. Uh, and then there was also some uh, Lake Havasu pictures where they were out testing and there was some, some spy shots out there. So those are the two biggest well-known photos, uh, spy photos of the Pro XP before it came out. And, um, 
you know, it's funny because when those photos came out, everybody was just like, oh, those things look horrible, blah, blah. Well, what they didn't realize was that they were showing off a lot of tech that wasn't going to come out for another couple of years. So um, they were showing where they were going. Exactly. Yeah. And so sometimes during R&D, it's just impossible to mask your hand. Like your poker face just isn't going to be available and you're going to have to kind of bear witness to some of the stuff you're working on. And, and that's exactly what happened. So um, yeah. So those spy picks really kind of showed that not only was Polaris willing to take a step back from their design patterns and go more towards an X3 concept, uh, where you had the higher shoulders, the lower sitting angles, um, you know, a lot of the design elements that were in a Maverick X3, they adopted for the Polaris Pro, uh, Razor Pro XP. And uh, I, I remember putting out the meme where it was the uh, the Tuttles arguing um, about, you know, oh, yeah. I, I, I gave you what you want, but now you're upset that I gave it to you. Right. So, um, so there was a lot of, that's where everybody was focusing. Me, I was focusing on what suspension was that? What motor was that? That doesn't look normal. Why is the muffler out the back center? Like, there's reasons for all those it's things. It's almost like you're an analytical guy. It's almost like I'm obsessive. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, again, I'm going to state for the fact that I am a Polaris fanboy. I love Polaris razors, generals. I love them all. Um, and there's no getting away from that. I'm not going to try to hide behind some sort of shroud of like, I'm impartial to all brands. If I was to pick a brand day one, it's going to be a razor for me. So, um, just I'm putting that context out there that, you know, I used to work for 509. I, 509 was acquired by Polaris, (laughs) which was acquired by Polaris, but I no longer work there. And I haven't worked there since September of last year, 2019. And I don't have any vested interest in that company whatsoever. So please take me at my word at, I am enjoying these products because I thoroughly enjoy these products, not because I'm being bought off. Zach likes Polaris. Like I like Canon cameras. Like I like Gibson guitars. So, yep. you know, I'm not a big brand honk myself, but uh, depending on what we're talking about, I can pull the brand honk card out of my wallet. And I'm the first to tell you, you know, the YXZ, as you say, built like a tank. I'll fully admit it. The Can-Am has the horsepower. It has the aggressiveness. Fully admit it. Um, and I would, I'll call out every mistake that Polaris makes on every single one of their cars every single day. Because yeah, um, we've done a podcast of how much we loved the Kawasaki. Yep. Yep. So exactly. The KRX is an amazing machine. I would own one if I could. Harpy. And uh, anyways, back on track. We're here to talk. Back to Polaris. (laughs) How many times are we going to do that across this episode? I'm not going to let it go. (laughs) It's going to be a radio voice intro for everything. (laughs) Back to. And we're back. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, anyways, let's start with the big elephant in the room, the powertrain, and more specifically, the motor. So for years, we've talked about how you know, Polaris' twin cylinder is just getting old in the tooth. It's just becoming to show its age, and they're not able to get the performance gains out of it that everybody was expecting they would. Um, I mean, how long did it take them to get from sub 150 horsepower to, you know, mid high range horsepower? So or whatever. Yeah. It took them a lot of competition coming into the space, and it took them a lot of years to, to get to that point. So um, the powertrain is looking so. Let me backtrack a little bit. They also own the Slingshot brand. They created the Slingshot brand. They made this whole new market segment called Slingshot. It's a three-wheeled auto cycle with two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back, similar to like the BRP, uh, Ry- is it BRP Riker? Um, um, so there, there are other three-wheeled motorcycles out there with two in the front, one in the back. Um, and this is a more of a car where you're not straddling the vehicle. So you're not considered a motorcycle at that point, but you're not considered a car because you still have the belt driven rear wheel drive vehicle. So um, if you haven't sling- seen slingshots, check them out. They're pretty aggressive, pretty awesome. In my opinion, they're a very unique vehicle that confuses automobile enthusiasts. Uh, but if you are they're in, a jet ski for the land, if you're a UTV enthusiast, it makes total sense. Right. So um, check them out. But they own the, the slingshot brand. And the last couple of years, they've used GM motors in them. Uh, I think similar to the cobalt uh, motors. Ecotec. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, this year, they announced that they're coming out with their own uh, motor that they've developed in-house for this machine. And uh, the Polaris drivetrains, the power plants that they've put into the Razors, into the into the Rangers and the Generals and all that stuff have all been this Pro Star uh, motor development group. And um, they all kind of share technology and different parts and components, and they eventually just all upgrade over time and swap things in and out to get better. Uh, but this, uh, this Pro Star engine is a f- two-point 
zero liter four cylinder engine something completely new for polaris now i'm also going to pre uh note this one with the fact that they have patents on both three and four cylinder versions of this motor there is a possibility that across the board the three and the four may get swapped in and out and we don't really know which or way released at a different time or released at a different time so um going into all these rumors it's an important under thing to understand is that polaris being a multi-billion dollar corporation that they have a one-year plan a three-year plan a five-year plan a 10-year plan on everything they do and so when we're talking about building a new power plant and a new generation of power delivery to their high-end machines and maybe even their lower end machines maybe this is something that trickles down right they're going to be looking long term and they're not going to give everything right out right out the gate yeah i mean 18 months ago, I was in a procurement meeting in Chicago with Polaris, and the CEO told to the tune of about a 1,000 people that develop components or were in the process of bidding components, basically saying that uh, we've got a lot of things coming down the pipe, and we are going to lead the way. Right. That's basically verbatim what he said. Yep. And, and that's where Polaris used to be, right? They used to be the brand that developed the industry generated the uh, lobbying power in, in Washington to get these things approved and to push things into a in a place where the whole industry could grow. And um, so going into this, they're not going to put the biggest, baddest thing out right away. They're not even going to put the like middle tier baddest thing out right away. They're going to put a solid foundation that they can build upon year after year and continue to improve just like they did with the two cylinder series evolutions, not revolutions. Exactly. Right. So, um, the pro star two liter four cylinder engine that was put into the slingshot has been then thus rumored to be spread across the product lines and into the razor. We've been saying multi-cylinder for years on the, on the razors that we've seen development products out there. We've seen these cars driving a more than two cylinder engine. And everybody's discounted. Everybody said this will never happen, uh, whatever the case may be. And um, knowing that I've seen it and knowing how the, the life cycle in these things happens, it's it's we're right at that cusp of those things coming to fruition. So, right. uh, I mean, you got to think about it. We're like three years out now on the first spy pictures of the Polaris Pro Razor. Right. So to get to that point, they were still two years before that. Yeah. And everybody thought it was an RS1. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we, we were like new platform, new platform. No, that's an RS1. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do a spoiler alert for you. That was the uh, Pro XP. So right. uh, that platform came out last year, kind of just either one pissed you off that it's so ugly or two really kind of like floated your boat because it was something different that no one else had. Right. And uh, they made a bunch of improvements. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, shortcomings. Their, their cage is a two inch cage, but it's still thin metal. It's yeah. still not thick. Um, there's a lot of, you know, things like the hole in the door that people just really don't understand why that's there. Um, but all those things don't really matter when you talk about the fact that there's a strong aftermarket for these cars. I can tell you I've driven one now and I loved it. You yeah, know, you I got the drive I, one uh, yeah, a couple did, weeks ago. Yeah, I didn't drive it super aggressively or anything because it wasn't mine, but it, I mean... I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, they're 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 an amazing car. They handle great, um, even at sixty four inches. And we've talked before about sixty four inches being a great width for trail riding and and things like that. Um, they're they're great cars. Yeah, they, they're just there's no doubts about it. They're great cars. They do have some quirks about them, just like any other car, that do get kind of under your skin. But there's nothing that you can't deal with and and fix or replace or customize. So, um, going back to the powertrain. The first thing that people say, you're never going to fit a four cylinder underneath a razor platform. And to that, I say, one, that I've seen it, so I know it works. But two, what a lot of people don't realize is that with the switch to the Polaris Pro XP platform, they gained a ton of cubic inch space in the body frame for the engine, the transmission, for all the components that go underneath the bed behind the seats. And if you've ever been in a Pro XP, you would know there's a ton of space behind the seats too that is unaccounted for. There's pockets of space behind the seats and kind of between the the walls of the car and everything else that for some reason you're just sitting there going in, in the back of your head like, well, why did they do that? Yeah. And, it, and it's because they're future-proofing the platform. And so um, the, the rumor was that we we're going to come out with a more than two-cylinder engine and we're seeing that happen. 
Now we're seeing a brand new four cylinder engine from Polaris with the Pro Star name on it. And it looks exactly like what we've seen in pictures. We know what's going in the right. car. I can say that that engine block is going in the next Pro platform car. Yeah. And uh, Legality McGee online uh, wanting to fight over the fact that you can't put in an excess of a thousand cc motor in a side by side. Do a little bit more homework. There's not like definitive law in regards that says that you can't do that. There was some law written into action that, that would support that narrative, but I want to say it was something like only three states out of forty seven. Uh, well, th- out of forty seven so or something. What it is is that the government uh, was pushed to regulate these cars that were becoming an industry, and so the NTSB came out with this classification saying if you want to be this type of vehicle, you have to fall within these boundaries, and right. to do that, you get the benefit of not being held to the same standard as automobiles, right? No airbags, no crash tests. Right, like you're that. not having side impact ratings and all this other stuff. And so there's just they were just simply saying, if you want to be held to this classification, we have to put parameters around that. And the parameters are going to be a thousand CC. And uh, there's a number of other things, including roll cage, um, seat belts, uh, things like that. Now, at a federal level, That is kind of the starting point. It's then left to the local counties to write the laws and states to write the laws about what they're going to allow off trail or uh, on trail off highway and what they're going to classify and what the verbiage they're going to use and and all that. And then that is what impacts the industry to develop products and then that impacts the industry to ensure um, and all those different things, right? So just because there is a classification for a group of vehicles at a certain specification doesn't mean there can't be a second classification of vehicles. Right. And there is no law, there is no classification that says you have to be within these boundaries to be a classification. It's just the fact that there is a classification and now they're they're look there's looking like there's going to be a second classification. Right. Right. So with that out of the way, we can talk about what what we've been told. I can't say what we know. Like it's not out. You know, I mean, right. I'm just... I haven't touched it. Yeah, we haven't touched it. We haven't seen it, but we can talk about what's being speculated and... Uh, and what we've been told. Now, here, here's the thing about our speculation. I'm not, like, trying to toot our own horn, but we've got some information from some people that would flat out no. <laughs> End of story. Like, one of them in particular has been... One person that I know has been driving it, for yeah. sure. Has, has had wheel time, and I'm not talking 20 minutes. Right. Yeah. As in it's in the shop, it's being wrenched on. Right. Yeah. Right. And and I've seen the pictures. I've seen the leaked pictures from a long time ago, but also just like recent pictures of vehicles in Minnesota being tested on the test track. Like I've seen the photos. Yeah. And let's let's call it what it is, man. This is I mean I mean, I don't know, but I mean this may very well be the worst kept secret in U T V. I mean and here's why I say that. Almost a year ago, I was telling people, then we're jumping, we're jumping ahead here, but you've already covered the two liter. Yeah. I've said for almost a year now that Polaris has something coming and it's class 10 inspired. Right. So two liter is class 10. All the class 10 cars in the, in the score series are two liter Ecotex. Here's Polaris's two liter that may be coming out in a razor. Is it, are they going to be motivated to create their own race class with this car or are they just going to enter this thing into the class 10? Could be a little bit of both. I mean, right. by all accounts, you might be able to buy this car and it's race ready, throw a long travel on it. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and jump into the score Baja class in, in class, uh, class 10. But I have heard rumors that they're very likely going to make their own class with this particular car. Cause I mean, dude, they, there's no class that exists for what it is right now in UTV. This is a unicorn. So, but don't let Robbie hear you say that. Yeah. Yeah. But if this happens, <laughs> if this happens and next thing you know, we're running into a, uh, a turbo R, uh, a pro R with a two liter. I told you, like I was literally getting <laughs> laughed at. I told you, and yeah. you're going to be saying this a bunch of times too. But like I, I was saying that the, the a class ten inspired car is coming. Yeah, and, and it and looks like it looks like within a month we're going to be able to get it. And so everything that we've seen, and I've seen pictures of the exhaust manifold going straight from the header to the ex- the muffler, and there not being a turbo on it. So 
we're seeing this car coming out naturally aspirated out of the gate. And this is what I was talking about, where they're leaving themselves room to grow and to expand their product line without giving everything out, out of the gate. So yeah. um, we're talking about this block being naturally aspirated at launch doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be two liter. Like the block itself is a big block of aluminum right. that gets milled out, right? It could be a lot smaller. Now, when you're talking about it, could three, be a 1000 triple to come with, but this four liter or this two liter, this four cylinder two liter exists. It exists today. And we're looking at it in a car. <laughs> yeah. And so what we see in the next month, like when we start getting these these announcements to roll out and the and the imagery and the and the commercials and the hands on and all that stuff, it could very well be a triple. We they have the patent for that exact motor in a triple, and then they have the patents for that and and the production ready block in a four cylinder. So if it comes out at a three cylinder, I can guarantee you it's going to be at the thousand limit. If they come out with a three cylinder, if they come out of the gate with the four cylinder as the launch platform, it's going to be over a thousand cc. And if that happens, they're going to have to reclassify that car, and it's going to start a whole new game between politics, cities, trail systems, all that stuff. And we often talk about uh, evolution, evolutions instead of revolution. That's yep. a revolution. Yeah. It is. I mean, it, Yamaha came out with the manual. That was a revolution. Yep. You know, not many people followed suit. This will be a revolution. And the funny thing is that... Maybe not for insurance companies. But. <laughs> <laughs> and we've talked before about insurance companies as well. Like, there's, it's only a matter of time before they catch on to start raising the rates on these things. They're, it's they're already so, happening. They're so expensive. People are trashing them every weekend. It's just bound to happen. Yep. Now, you come out with a car that's $40,000 or something like that, and it costs us almost as much as a used luxury car, basically. They're going to be asking more premium for their for their product. Yeah, so, yeah. You better set your uh, you better set your deductibles as high as possible, man. It's yep. not going to be an easy car to insure. That's my guess. So one interesting concept that I didn't really think about until going into this talk that we're doing, if they're using the four cylinder out of the out of the um, the slingshot, those have different environmental regulations around them than the off road vehicles do. And if they're starting their own classification, because you're not going to be an on-road, like I'm dr highway driving with this thing, so I don't have to worry about emissions. While they do have to succumb to some California things that we all just deep down in is what it is. Love California. We just accept you <laughs> reluctantly. California might have red hair. We, I'm just yeah. saying that. Anyways, so they're not beholden to these regulations. And so the 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 reins were hold, held back on the on the 203 horsepower i think on the r type uh, slingshot this could very well be the same motor same four cylinders but with a lot more horsepower just because they don't have to have those regulations so i would just say to people that are are just not on the same page with this that it think it's all just smoke and mirrors it's happening it could very well be a three cylinder from launch like the cars we were seeing might not be consumer launch product that's just the fact but everything i've seen up to this point has been four cylinder and i've never seen a three cylinder on a car in a demo test car development development platform at all i've talked to some people that would know and put them on the spot just saying uh what do you think about this new four cylinder is it uh do i go that route and they're just like absolutely it's gonna kill <laughs> and they're not telling you it's not coming they're just saying they're, it's they're telling awesome. you it's coming yeah period yeah Yep. And so um, I would, I'm just, I've lived with the fact now that we're going to see a full four cylinder. That's where my headspace is at. If a tr triple happens, I'm just as excited as I was with a four cylinder. Yeah. Um, I think it could also lead to some regulations in the industry from the standpoint that you might have to have an operator's permit at some point. And I really wouldn't have a problem with that. You know, I mean, I, veteran riders that have been doing this a while have all encountered rookie riders, you know, people that really don't know what they're doing out on sand, uh, guys that go out and spend $30,000 on a new pro XP and total it within 20 minutes. I've, How many times have we seen a post in Facebook groups? More times than I could count. Less than yeah. 50 miles totaled. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It's, uh, I mean, every time that that happens, I just think of the money that's going to cost me down the road in insurance, even though I've never made an insurance claim on a side by side. Right. So, yeah. So, um, as far as the powertrain goes, I think that uh, 2020 is the year that we see 
Polaris pull out the four cylinder. And again, if it's a triple, I'm just as happy because I know the four cylinder is going to follow at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, I, to anyone that says it doesn't fit, you're sadly mistaken. It fits just fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of some of the stuff that I've heard, I shared this with you. I've heard, uh, obviously got confirmed by multiple sources that do not know each other that it is a two liter. Yeah. Uh, or there is a two liter or there's option. a version that is a two liter. I also heard 74 inches. Yeah. That should scare nobody. I mean, I'm telling you right now, the toy hauler I'm looking at right now at its most narrow point is 81. So yeah. these toy hauler companies are starting to get ready for these cars getting bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, I, I, there's, there's some very encouraging stuff. I mean, naturally aspirated doesn't, I mean, you got a two liter, let's just say it's roughly running around 200 horsepower. The two liters on um, the class 10, you, the, some of the horsepower numbers that people are getting out of that Ecotech system would blow your mind. Yep. Blow your mind. I mean, yep. it's not uncommon to hear 500. It's not uncommon to hear 800. Well, I mean, and even if, the Red Bull OT3 that ran Dakar was a VW triple. Yeah. And a lot smaller. Yeah. So it's not that they're not capable. No, I mean, if you, if you take this car with the headroom that it might have, you know, we don't know anything about, I mean, does it have forged internals, forged pistons, forged rods, this, that, and the other. If it could handle some boost, somebody like Evo, somebody like Boondocker, somebody like Whalen, they're going to come out with an aftermarket turbo kit for this thing. And just based on its displacement, it could very well replace the YXZ on the Sand Outlaws drag strip. Oh, very, very I, I possibly. Would, I, I would bet on it. Now, I'm I'm not off the top of my head. I can't remember exactly what the YXZ weighs, but nothing. <laughs> that, that's where <laughs> bone my stock. My car weighs sixteen hundred, and yeah. I guarantee you those Packard cars are probably somewhere around thirteen. Yeah, maybe fourteen hundred. And that's and those where guys it, are really really muscular though. So I mean that adds weight <laughs> too. So, uh, so anyways, let's let's not deviate too much. The the powertrain it's going to happen. It's most likely a four cylinder. It could very well possibly be a three, but we've never seen those pictures. We've only seen four cylinder right. pictures. And, and to be honest with you, we're talking about uh, the Pro XP chassis, which is going to be referred to as the Pro R. The Pro XP chassis at 72 inches, which it, I wanted. I really wanted. Like, I mean, as much as I really liked that car in a 64-inch frame, I just loved you knew the what 72 idea of 72. Now, and I've been, I own a 72. Yeah. I don't want to go backwards. Right. Yeah. And that chassis, that car, that's that capability on a 72-inch, or in this case, 74, I just envisioned this thing annihilating whoops out on sand. Right. And just being an amazing ride. So, uh, moving on from the block, we go to the transmission. And this is kind of where the biggest, I think friction point has been between the concept of sticking this thing in there. That's what she said. So the transmission out of the slingshot is a brand new Polaris made sequential hydraulically driven five speed uh, automatic. Um, now you can override that and you can do manual shifting and all that just like you would on a YXESS, right? Um, but everyone says, hey, you're not going to fit a standard transmission between the engine bay and the back seats of a Razor. There's just no room for it. Well, to that, I would argue the four cylinder really isn't that long in the first place. And secondly, we published out the Polaris's patent on the marriage of the transmission to the block and then to a transfer case to a split axle drivetrain. A lot of joints in that diagram too <laughs> that got me a little worried. Uh, I yeah. think that was the next I might discussion be spending around that. A lot of time in two wheel drive. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that that patent had six U joints in it. Yep. So uh, yes, you're adding complication. Yes, you're adding more moving parts. Yes, you're adding more joints. Yes, you're, a- you're adding rotating resistance too. You're adding more resistance. You're adding more carrier bearings. And the one that was in the patent was pretty puny in its form of patent drawings but i think in real world that's just going to look like a big carrier bearing that you would normally see in the in the in the player so right, right um but what this does is it takes you away from the old style of you know having the transmission married to the cvt and then having the drive come out to the front wheels and move to uh front and rear differentials which are a little bit more reliable um and easier to repair than having the transmission married to the block, right? So um, if you talk about how that power get delivery gets to that dr- that transfer case from the block, that's where it gets interesting because, yes, we could very well see the five-speed show up. I don't think it's going to end up... I, initially, I thought it was going to happen this, this month. 
I don't think that's going to happen until next year, if maybe even the, the fall of next year. It's it's developed, though. It's there. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And From what I understand. Yeah, so. from what I've been told, that is the case. Yeah. So what may, what threw me for a loop this last week was when I realized that the patent that I had posted for the new CVT housing with the air ducts on top instead of coming in from the side was there to facilitate the CVT being behind the seats. So no longer on the driver's side between the wheels and the engine, but between the seats and the block. And so that is what we've been told is going to happen. Or that's what I've been told that's that's going to happen. I don't know what they told you, but uh, the people that I've talked to has said, you're going to see the CVT be a perpendicular to the the car and that you're going to access it from behind the firewall. This is very reminiscent to the early, I think, 800s. And think. that makes me nervous. Yeah. It, yeah. It, I'd have to see it and see how quickly you can access it. Well, here's the thing. If you blow the belt, you're not going anywhere quickly. Right. So it's not how quick you can do it. It's just a matter of if you can and how easy you get to it. So if you have to get to it from the side and have to reach into the engine bay to try to make that all work and not have straight on visibility to that, those sheaves, I foresee that being a loss. Yeah. But if you can take the seats out and just pull the firewall off and have full access to your engine, I mean, yeah. how huge... Well, so if you think about the bed of the XP or the Pro XP, you can take the whole bed out and have full access to the top of the motor. Yeah. All the way. The entire thing gets exposed. So if you just further that one more step and you have full access from the firewall, you essentially have entire access to the, the entirety of the motor from all angles, which is a win in my opinion. And there's a group of people out there that say, we're not buying it unless it has a CVT. And there's a group out there that says, why would I buy it? Why would I pay that much for a car if it didn't have the transmission, the five speed? So I think what's going to happen is, I've already said before, this pro chassis, I think will eventually trickle down to the XP models. And I think what you know now as the pro XP will become the lower end model car. And over time, the pro R is going to be the more race inspired machine that's going to have the higher end components, the turbos and all that stuff. The one we all want. Right. The one that the quote unquote unicorn we've been waiting for from Polaris. And I think that you're going to end up seeing that 2019 styling of the Razor with the fangs and all that stuff disappear and go into this pro chassis. And then you're going to have the XP platform and the R platform and eventually an RS platform. I think that's going to end up how they tier them to where you have the XP being the con- the standard consumer, the R being the sports enthusiast, and then the RS being the the racing high end high dollar cars. And those are to me the ones that, if it all comes out and they launch without the two liter and they they launch with a smaller liter engine, then that's where those two liters going to kick in. That's where the turbos are going to come in. And realistically speaking, you could make that platform a supercharged platform if you if you modified the bed. So. I don't know where they're going to go with it. I think they're going to stick with turbos. That's what they know. That's what they make. Yeah. And the other thing is too, is I'm like, we're looking at a picture right now of the motor. The motor already has a belt, you know, cause it has an alternator yep. to it, um, which is encouraging. I mean, I mean, honestly, I think that's probably going to become more standard in the industry. So, you know, that lends a little bit of, uh, uh, perspective validity to the, them going, towards the supercharger. I'm, I'm a turbo guy. Like I, I just, I, I don't want to take power to make power. Right. Um, you know, but that said, I mean, a supercharger, if you like to do wheelies, you get power right now. So, I mean, that's a, that's a way. You, I'm a, a big fan of supercharging. I don't, well, if um, I was going to build a sand car, it'd be a supercharged car for sure. Yeah. And how do you feel like being a battery guy, seeing that alternator on there? I think it's, it's long overdue, yeah. you know, um, the, one of the most underrated features about the Pro XP was a 750 watt stator, which industry standard somewhere around 480 to 500. It was a big jump. So basically, you have 75 amps to work with at 12 volts as opposed to like 48 to 50. So, what does act- what does a consumer compact car kind of put out on their alternators? Yeah, 200, 150, 200. Okay, that, take, that's 220. Small. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's grown a ton. I mean, it, it's a different answer in 1999 versus what it is now. Yeah, yeah. So looking at this picture of the motor, um, I haven't really dug into the slingshot specs on that on that alternator, like what they've actually put out there. 
But, you know, considering the visual size and specs of that alternator, where would you guess that that would land it, on an it, output? I mean, it looks like almost like a little Delco Remy or something. It's probably, give or take, uh, I'm speculating here, probably about maybe 110, 120. Yeah. So, so what do you think the likelihood is that there's also a stator involved? Slim to none. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen both a stator no. and an alternator together? Never. Well, so the Kawasaki. Well, I mean, has, I, I have like in the uh, in the uh, I mean the YXE and stuff like that, but that's all aftermarket editions, right? Yeah. So I'm not familiar with the KRX upgrade, but they do have a factory alternator upgrade that you can put on the KRX. So it's going to run both. So um, that's where that's where I'm like, okay, how does that work? Because um, you're going to have the stator running either way, any either way. Is it getting cut off or is it working in conjunction with it? And there's there some sort of like to the best of my knowledge, it wouldn't cut anything off, so. right? So it'd be interesting how that works out. Um, but from this engine block, it all is very clean. There's not a lot of moving parts exposed. Like everything is super compact and the oil filter is right there on the side. Like everything is just, in my opinion, more serviceable than any other UTV engine I've seen. It has a lay, uh, the way that it kind of lays and hopefully it lays in the engine bay the same way. Like the, the YXZ motor was so exposed and everything was so accessible. This looks like it might be a kind of a similar deal. Right. And that's one thing that I, I really liked about the YXZ is that you walk up to that motor and you're like, oh, I can work on that. Absolutely. So yeah, get your hands right in there. For sure. Except when it's hot. So, um, so what we're expecting uh, this month is to come out with a four cylinder Pro Star engine that we've seen developed for the slingshot and all the other applications and then married to a cvt behind the seats uh transmission um the new cvt housing looks just almost identical to all the other ones but one thing that i was interested uh i don't know if their their patent drawing is applicable to scale but look at the primary versus the secondary large it, it seems like they've given themselves more ramp up to work with you know what i mean the sheaves are bigger. They, they're not as dramatically different in size. So I don't know exactly what that means for gear ratio and all that stuff. But that if if the patent drawing is anything related to where the size of their sheaves are going to be going into 21, that'll be a really interesting story to see how that power delivery uh, comes into play. Right, right. Uh, and then, you know, we, we just talked about the uh, transfer case and the six U joints to the diffs. Um, these diffs in the patents look a lot like... Um, the diffs you would see in like the turbo S or the RS one. So I would assume that they're probably going to use the same parts. Um, if not, uh, a slightly modified version of it. Um, and then once we get out of the, uh, the powertrain, we get to the suspension. So if we look at the photo, uh, rendering that I posted on Facebook, you'll notice that, uh, the back of the car has bigger, beefier trailing arms and an exposed rail that goes down the middle. This rendering, just so that everybody understands what's going on, uh, this rendering is what I took from photos and information I was given and then interpreted that into a visual form. So this is using, you know, like a 2020 model razor and then right. and Photoshopping the crap out right. of it. Right. Um, but uh, so larger trailing arms, more in the Can-Am style that where they get real big, real fast towards the towards the hub. And they need to. And what you'll also notice is that attached to that is a five lug wheel that we saw in the blue tarp photos. So from what we've been told, those wheels are a reality and they're happening and you're going to start seeing five lug Polaris razors. So that's gonna make a lot of people happy. Um, the, in, the understanding on my side is that that's going to be a 15 inch wheel, which in some states in jurisdictions, 15 inch wheels are not applicable on those trails. They can't get certified. So that's going to be another one of those things where we say classifications may change. There might be new rules. There might be new applications. It's going to test uh, Polaris's political lobby skills. You know, Definitely. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. Some of that stuff gets rewritten. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, with how easy... It's not, it's not like America doesn't have a bunch of dated and dumb laws. <laughs> As we've seen over the last, uh, over the last year. So... Um, the interesting thing uh, about that is there's also a change to maybe more um, what look and appear to be Maxxis Liberty tires, which you're familiar with on your RC. Very familiar. Um, great all-terrain tire. Um, very much not uh, the same tire as the carnivores. So everybody went to the carnivores because they're a great all-around 
do everything tire. Yeah, the Liberty is a truck tire. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's an LT inspired tire. Yeah, and it literally just is a smaller version of the truck tires, right? So this car has gotten a lot of grief from people because everyone says this is going to not be a car for the East Coast. This isn't not going to be a car that we can do on our trails. Well, I'm sorry, but this car is not meant for you. This car is meant for California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Oregon, Washington, Ian, Idaho, the side by side guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I foresee that the change in tire is indicative of where they're going with the car and that this car is specifically meant to answer the turbo RR series Mavericks that Can-Am has been put out for the last couple of years. Um, and so another interesting thing on this is that uh, they're going to retain the, the, the live valve, the, the ride command and the uh, dynamic suspension and all that. Right. So Can-Am just came out with their turbo RRs with smart shocks, which is their version of live valve. And on their shocks, and you're familiar with, they have high and low speed compression settings, but uh, they also now have rebound control, and it's all built into the smart shocks, uh, the live valve technology. So when we're looking at the photos of the new Pro R, everything points to the rear shock being a 3.0 shock, which is different because they went away from that. In 2016, they launched the turbo with Fox Podium 2.5s in the front and 3.0s in the back what was like really awesome about that car it was like a free a freebie that you just got for buying the car and then they went eventually to the walker evans unless you bought the the higher end ride command editions the fox editions and even at that they were still the two fives and then they went to the ride command with live valve uh via the dynamic suspension and those are all up to this year have all been two five everybody's saying that this car is going to be super heavy that the block is just too big whatever well guess what you can fix that with 3.0 shocks you get more valving, more throughput, more more transfer of energy uh, with a 3.0 shock. So I'm predicting that this is me predicting. This is not me being told this, that we're going to see a 2.5.3.0 package on Dynamics. What may, they might even call it 3.0. Who knows? Because the 2.0 is not really a 2.0. Um, that's a whole different conversation. Maybe we should have Al McBeth or somebody on to, 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 to explain that one. Right. But um I foresee that being a 2530 package and that they adopt the slow and fast re- compression along with rebound adjustment, just like can did with their turbo RR for 2021. I think that's going to be what they need to do for, for taking this over the edge to be the next generation of cars for these racers and these, these sports enthusiasts. And then the front end of the suspension, I've seen photos, so I know it's going to happen. U shaped upper I arms to allow the shock to go through and mount to the lower a arm. And that's going to change the game for Polaris handling on, you know, diving into corners and all that stuff. The transfer of energy to the shock is going to be so much more optimized and you're going to see a lot less uh, ball joint fatigue. Yeah, less push, more more outside pressure. I, uh, I'm looking forward to it. So that's a home run in my opinion. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's honestly should be industry standard. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the th- reasons they don't do that is because you have to have either lower upper shock mounts or you have to have longer shocks. So I think that's, uh, I think that's exactly what they need to do. It's going to be a home run for them. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have been saying, you know, they must be paying Robbie Gordon patents, uh, patent fees on that uh, mounting system. But you know what, he wasn't the first one to do that. And uh, if anybody has the horsepower uh, in the lobbying department, legal department to to find the loopholes, Players has got it. Yeah. No, they're not short on resources. So moving on from suspension, we've talked about the wheels and the tires. Um, you know, width, we've, we've touched on it being 74 inches. Um, initially, I was told a lot wider than that. So what I'm speculating is that we're going to see a 74 inch come out this fall. And then we're going to see the... <coughs> And then we're going to see the next version of it uh, come out with like the the S model come out with maybe a 78 inch uh, uh, platform. So um, and then with the lower mounted shocks and all that stuff, you know, we could see the upper mounts go further out towards the wheel bells and be more of a a wider platform, maybe similar to like the reflex suspension uh, upgrades that you can do on these cars. Um, the cage has been uh, slightly modified, uh, so it no longer has the fake uh, B pillars that um, the current generation has. They have two identical B pillars that come down. Uh, there's a zigzag brace in them, and then they come down 
behind the plastics with a small lightweight uh, piece that joins them together and then mounts to the frame and ultimately uh, just is not as strong as it could be. And this new this new design pattern with the single B pillar and the, the extended C pillar, uh, which I have seen in photos and I know it's real, um, is going to be much more safe in its design uh, than it was on the current model. I don't foresee them coming out with any kind of thicker walled Rops, I think it's all going to be the same stuff. So everyone's yeah, still going to dig on it. Well, yeah, everybody's going to want to know why they can't get a cage from the factory that is uh, sufficient enough for major rollovers. It's liability, right. you know? Yeah. And I think there's a lot that goes into that. Like, I'm going to be the one of the first people that stands up for that argument and says, we should be getting safer cages from OEMs. On the other hand, on their side, their perspective on that issue is... If we say that this is safe in a 60 mile an hour rollover and then you get hurt <laughs> and you get hurt, guess who gets sued? Exactly. Right. So th- they're going to, the the reality of it is they're never going to do that. One for cost savings two because they can't ensure their Exposure. cars. They're just not going to be able to li- They're not going to come out of the gate and say, I'm going to be liable for that. Right. They're, they're just not. And so anybody that comes out and says, we want a cage rated at this. Well, the chassis has to be rated for that. The walls, the doors, the mm-hmm. cage, everything has to be rated for that. And you're already jumping into a $75,000 car at that point. So um, all those guys that say Speed UTV is changing the game by putting a better chassis and a better cage together. Um, in one essence, yes, they are coming out of the gate with a safer system. And I'm going to be the first to say that. But at the same time, they're bringing on a lot of liability. Well, Robbie's not going to come out there and say this is totally safe for you to roll at 35 miles an hour. That's never going to come out of his mouth. Right. You know, and it, I'd be shocked if it did. I'd just, that'd be a head scratcher. Yeah. The first thing you're going to hear him say is this is going to be the safest vehicle in the industry, which very well could be, but he's never going to say that I guarantee you're going to be safe Yeah. in a 60 mile an hour roll. Nobody over. ever will. <laughs> yeah. So, as a corporation, Polaris will never do that. Just get over it, it and rely on the fact that you're buying a cage if you plan on going fast. Um, four-seater options, ready to go. People have said they're there, driven them, have them. So My I, favorite I, part is after you posted this up, that was the first question everybody had. Is there a four-seater? <laughs> it's well, like, oh, there was gosh, a point in time. Be patient. We don't even know that. We don't even know what we know yet. <laughs> exactly. There has always been this like argument on if there should be four seaters or if like out of the gate, they should offer four seaters like Kawasaki came out of the gate with only a two seater. Right. Right. And there's already renderings of a four seater that look amazing. And why didn't they bring it out? Well, there's a huge market for four seaters, but at the same time, they know their customer base. They know it's a loyal base and they're going to be coming from Terex's and mules and things like that. They know how many two-seaters they've sold. They know how many four-seaters they've sold. They know how many are in, are in use today. And they know how much of the market's going to jump ship if they have it. It might not be worth the two of them first get-go. It might be a 21, 22 item. But they're definitely there's definitely a market. The four-seaters right. are, are selling, I want to say, almost half of what the two-seaters sell. So that's a pretty big margin. Well, actually, I heard the most in-demand machine in the side-by-side industry is a Turbo S four-seater. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And that doesn't surprise me. Nope. And it shouldn't surprise anybody. That yeah. is one of the most capable, most comfortable, most all-around cars that you can buy on on the market today. Yeah. And then we get down to release dates. So if we look at the history of these cars coming out, these kind of these premier top-tier cars coming from the manufacturers, specifically Polaris, they always follow the dealer meeting. And, or not the dealer meeting, the, um, the investor meeting. That meeting last year was on the 23rd, I think. And then the car came out that following weekend, the Pro XP. This year, that date falls, I think, on the 28th. uh, And then the actual weekend being the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of August. So I would suspect that this week, I've heard rumors of dealers already starting to place orders and such. So with COVID and how that all changed the game where they don't have a physical dealer meeting uh, this year, um, I, I don't doubt that they're placing orders now for same looking 21 models as 2020 models. So Turbo S's, XP1000s, all those that don't have body changes, don't have really anything other than a colorway change. They probably are ordering those this week. Right. But I, I'd be willing to put money on the fact that we see this Pro R come out August 1st, 2nd, or 3rd. 
and more than likely the second. Uh, or no, that'd be the Sunday. So the first, I, I would be willing to put money if I had money to put on August 1st being the release date of the Pro R. Well, I hope so because we'll be home. Because if it happens <laughs> that the week day, after yeah. that, we will not please, be home. Uh, <laughs> Polaris, please be considerate of my uh, release schedule and yeah. that I can only post while I'm uh, not on the road. So, uh, yeah, because we got a big trip coming up. Yeah, we do. Um, in Idaho, and uh, we're going to be doing a long, um, week long trip up from the southern border. And uh, that should be interesting. So, Polaris, please release on the first so we can get that content out to our, our viewers. Um, but if it does come out, we'll be on the road and we won't be able to podcast it until we get back. So, and where we're going, there is no cell service. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we've we've posted all this content, all the patents, all those things on our Facebook page, our Instagrams, um, and on our website. We have a, a kind of a summary write-up of all those. And so if you're interested or have a buddy that's interested, you can send those links to him or her, sorry, to them, um, and uh, get fully informed, and we'll keep updating them as, as they roll through. So if we get any new information, uh, we'll put it there, and we'll make sure to post it on social media as well. I can't believe you just gender-assumed. Apologize. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I will say that for all those people that judge people that say that the industry is mixed and all that, it, it's... The real the reality of it is that it's like ninety. I think the number was ninety three percent male. Yeah, and and the the female group in the UTV market is growing. Oh, and it's I think that's a awesome, lot, man. I think you posted the other day in one of the groups. You know, where are all the women at? No, what I put po- like I, I I manage this this page centric to uh, Western Montana, Northern Idaho, and Eastern Washington, and out of every ten people that asked to be a part of it, eight of them are women. So I posted it up. I'm like, I. I just cited that stat it said about 80 percent of the people that are joining the page are women all right ladies post it up what it where are you, what are you wheeling where are you wheeling you know yep. it's just basically them to opportunity, An opportunity. For, for them to introduce themselves if you look at at the actual metrics um it's just you assume out of just sheer numbers that the person you're talking to is a guy but that's not to say that women don't. And there's some awesome wheelers out there and there's some awesome racers out there that are tearing up the race course uh, in these cars. And uh, so no, no uh, lesser than anyone else. They are awesome. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, wanna, I mean, in my opinion, the greatest short course racer for UTV on the planet is Corey Weller. <laughs> yeah, she just dominates. Yeah, she kills. <laughs> so um, th- th- I-, I wish I knew everybody's names and everybody's placements, but there's just so many of them and I'm just not in it all the time to, to be co- able to call them out. But there are so many female racers out there, up and coming ones and ones that are actually starting to break through and, and make podiums and, and all that. It's just, it's really cool to see uh, the guys have a run for their money. Yeah. So anyways, Polaris Pro uh, R, uh, let me correct myself. Polaris Razor Pro R, uh, no longer Pro XP because as I assume, uh, they're going to dis- dis- separate those two uh, segments of their of their models into uh, basic consumer and advanced consumer models and uh, down the road, maybe even see an RS. So uh, the Polaris uh, Razor Pro are uh, slated for the end of the month. And those are all the rumors and speculations that we've come to uh, summarize into one cohesive story. And uh, we're looking forward to getting it, uh, seeing the car come out. We're looking forward to seeing the hands-on, looking to see, you know, how it feels and drives and, you know, how that engine performs. Um, I've heard it has a really good throaty sound to it, a good, you know, idle that would just make anybody smile. Yeah. So... No, it's exciting, man. I mean, when you're following the news, there was just a recently some information came out about uh, a vaccine for COVID and uh, that was coming out of uh, Oxford. There's so much controversy around this freaking virus. It's just one of those things where all I care about is getting back to normal or at least as close to normal as we can human humanly possibly do. And I'm looking at this car coming out, just dreaming, just hoping that it's going to be at UTV takeover yeah. for us to take out and go oh, rip in, in uh, 2021. And that can't come quick enough. For so. sure. This is, this is a nice uh, highlight in a long year that has been perpetually dark. And uh, we hope to see even more of this stuff yeah. coming from even more men. We still haven't seen what Yamaha is doing. Uh, this year. So it'd be interesting to see if they come out this year with anything or if they wait till next year. Rumor is that they're going to have something in October. Um, uh, rumor is that it is a new platform and that is the extent. 
you know, yeah, I mean, pretty it, tight. it could be, it could be sport. It could be sport utility. It could be a revamp of the YXZ. One thing to take into consideration, a lot of the Japanese OEs, they do things in stages four years, you know, like Yamaha will come out with a YZ, a YZF 450. And they really won't do like a big model rollover in from a, uh, they won't evolve it for about four years, give yeah. or take. Suzuki's the same way. And I'm still holding on to my, uh, my, 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 uh, fantasy of uh textron and yamaha coming together uh in one cohesive brand or selling off one act entity of it i i think if anybody in the japanese uh, oe game were gonna come together I, I think it would be suzuki and kawasaki that's just my oh, guess they're so big though they're they so are. big they are i think that the two of them they make they'd make a monster my <laughs> gosh <laughs> it would be a different uh animal altogether i really I think. think it I, but I think uh it would. There's just so much overlap between Textron and Yamaha. I just I foresee Textron getting out of that game that they failed to get into correctly and just shoving it off over to Yamaha. But we'll I see. haven't heard I haven't heard Textron news in so long that I couldn't even cite what it was. I have no idea what that company is. I literally is up looked to. up yes uh, last night uh, just to make sure that they still had that Wildcat XX on the website. Yeah, no, I went to uh, I went to a Harley Davidson dealer, and they were also a Textron dealer, and there was nothing on their wall on, on their signage that suggested yeah. they were a Textron dealer. And they were telling me, "Well, everything's sold." I'm like, "It's sold because nobody has inventory because <laughs> right there's now. no inventory. There's no inventory in the UTV world." Yeah, and uh, I basically start talking to them about what it's like to deal with those guys. They're like, "Dude, we don't know anything. We don't know where nobody the, knows the, anything. That we don't know what their what their plan is or anything like that." They're just like, "These guys are." massive company like yeah. incredibly big in tech strong it is right but uh, nobody had any information. and the off-road market is, is so small compared to everything else that yeah. i mean their their military work it doesn't even scratch the sur i mean off-road doesn't even scratch the surface of what that place right. does probably from a military standpoint I, I would be willing to bet that uh textron bought arctic cat just for their patents and the rest of it they could care less about and i wouldn't be surprised if they dump it you know relatively soon with the next year or so i hope not you know i i hope somebody dev and internally there develops some passion for it and really wants to push the envelope right so well i mean that i mean there's very few companies out there that would be able to compete at a scale of polaris yeah right and so they're in a position where they could like they actually compete in a lot of out market places outside of off-road they compete in defense they compete in um you know a small utility vehicle and and golf cart type stuff yeah, easy go uh, easy go or club car one of the yeah. two is owned by textron yeah so they compete a lot and so it makes sense for them to say we're getting into the game by buying arctic cat but we just haven't seen the fruits of that yet right and we've only seen the diminishing <laughs> trailing off of that brand so yeah yeah, and, and it's interesting too because like Polaris owns a golf cart company, Textron owns a golf cart company. Polaris has an off-road wing. Textron's got an off-road wing. Snowmobiles, the whole ball of wax. The difference is, is Polaris eats, sleeps, and breathes this. Yeah. Whereas Textron, this is, I mean, almost like just it's a hobby. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, they're focused mostly yeah. on aerial stuff and, yeah. and defense contracts and things like that. So, um, I think Textron stands the 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 most success in competing with Polaris. And, you know, Can-Am and the rest of them, but um, it's just time will tell. We just yeah. haven't seen the movement. I think Yamaha is the means to com compete with Polaris, but, you know, whether or not they'll actually do it remains to be seen. I, and I, th I don't think it's like a financial means to compete with Polaris. It's just, no. it's an engineering, yeah. you know. That's, and, mar and mind share. I yeah. mean, that's why the pro came out was to compete with the X3. So it was getting too much mind share. They had to, they had to react faster than I think they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, I think they wanted to get another couple of years out of their 19, you know, design refresh uh, before they came out with it. But I think that they were, for one, ready. They had it in the wings ready to go. Um and uh, they were able to come out with something that competed well. Um, I think this new evolu this new evolution of that platform and the powertrain and everything else is just going to lead even more ability for players to dominate. Um, and anyone that tells me that they're not dominating, that Can Am's dominating, go to the sales uh, figures. I, I just I just they don't lie. Challenge you to watch the books and see the numbers and yep. listen to the dealer the investor meetings because they're all. Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, if you follow the money, you know who the winner is. Yeah. And that goes in any frame of business whatsoever. And so. that does not in any way change the perspective of how good of a car the X3 is. Like, it's still a great car and better than most Polaris models. But on the other hand, if we're talking about success, Polaris is still succeeding better than anyone else out there. No, no question about it.
So anyways, Polaris Pro R coming out this year, and uh, we're hoping it's a four-cylinder. It sure looks like it is to us, so uh, interesting times to come, Ian. Yeah, rumors, rumors, and more rumors, so don't hold us to any of this. <laughs> <laughs> we're not on record, right? That's not at all. <laughs> well, we don't know until we know, Ian. So until next guy, t- until next time, guys Get and gals, because I don't want a gendered stereotype here. Yeah. Uh, peace. Peace.